I will invite the three panelists that will dialogue with Guy. And, okay. Uh, at first, I want to invite uh, a particular friend of mine. She is psychologist, master clinical psychologist, IIBA international trainer, member of IABSP, Instituto de Análise Bioenergética de São Paulo. Also trained in Corey Energetic, Family Therapy, NLP, Timeline Therapy, Systemic Constellation, and she works in a private office in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and teaches bioenergetic analysis in several cities of Brazil, as well as teaches in Core Energetic in Brasilia. Author of a book, Grounding and Autonomy. With you, Odila Weigand. this yeah wow after this talk from Guy we are in such an enchantment and joyful state and I'll have to bring you back to some other realities which is what I'm going to talk about because <coughs> Things happen in life, and we may lose the state. And then, as we saw with the different uh, roles of the therapist, the different functions of the therapist, luckily, we can count on our own brain's uh, plasticity to recover and the therapy help. So I'm going to approach the subject looking at the life force and how it derives from the body and sustains the life of mind and spirit as Lowen taught us and Guy has expanded today so wonderfully. In bioenergetic analysis, we have focused on the body's role of creating, holding, charging, discharging, and regulating the life force. And this is what I want to talk about here in our conversation highlighting the reparative property of our memory to restore and free the life force after a traumatic event. I have been in bioenergetics for more than 35 years and followed for the different evolutions that happened in the meantime. We have been involved in finding out the best ways to combine top-down and bottom-up strategies in our personal and clinical work to maintain or recover nervous system self-regulation with the goal of healing developmental traumas or traumas caused by particular events. I want to share a violent trauma experience I lived through and what I learned on the way to recover my life force. The first lesson that I learned from this experience was about the order and the sequence of the different psychotherapeutic approaches. I had to find out first how much excitement was tolerable and the need to calm down the autonomic nervous system before trying more active interventions like the expression of anger and fear and the neurogenic tremors, which are so helpful. In my experience, when I first tried the neurogenic tremors, or what we call vibrations in bioenergetics, much earlier than this term appeared, I felt that the excitement that rose, it rose to an unbearable level, instead of producing relief. 
So I needed to deactivate the hyperarousal system first and return my body to the window of tolerance. After relaxation, stretching, hypnosis, I could express some anger with my therapist, but it was not yet a solution. The second thing I lived through after that experience was about the possibility to introduce new reparative memories in the process of recovery, reconsolidation, and re-encoding of a traumatic memory. To do this before starting neurogenic tremors. Maybe these words, uh, reconsolidation, re-encoding, may sound somewhat strange, but uh, our colleague, Humayun Shari, where is he? He's here in this room. He wrote two wonderful articles in the Bioenergetic Journals, 19, uh, 2017, 2018, and I was very happy to find this reference because I've been studying and dealing with the subject for some time, the memory um, and its possibilities. Well, I knew the concepts and the theory, but I had to feel it in my body. So I'll get into some considerations, theoretic considerations. Neuroscience explains that each time a memory is recovered, it does not appear to our minds as things happened. It is represented in the mind, in the present, modified by facts, perceptions, and experiences that happened after the event. And our brain cannot distinguish very well between facts that really happened and imagined situations especially in the territory of implicit memory, okay? Our eyes are not only to see, they are also projectors that show a second story. And this second story may well be a new reconstructed one. Neuroplasticity allows the creation of a new register which, when associated with the old neural network, gives rise to a new updated network. With the intensity and the repetition, and because the new story brings more comfort, the brain seems to choose the new reparative neural pathway and this one tends to be more used, and the old one fall into disuse. We learned that in psychology faculty, university, you know, about the uh, theory of um, learning. One of the functions of the hippocampus is to balance amygdala activity for the resolution of PTSD, and hippocampus activity. The hippocampus is that little organ inside our brain and it is essential for processing language and very important. It is also part of organizing and encoding memory as past, present, and future. As the amygdala presents um, traumatic memories as here, happening now. The hippocampus, when it is um, capable of acting, it will uh, codify the experience as a past experience. And then, of course, we realize it's not an immediate threat. Besides bioenergetic analysis, I have been trained in timeline therapy and Milton Erickson hypnosis which are helpful top-down tools for trauma healing. Peter Levine also in the 1996 conference in, began to influence our theoretical and practical ways of doing therapy, as well as Stephen Porges with polyvagal theory, which has been widely used in this conference in different workshops. 
Um, now, I wonder, uh, how is the slide? Is the slide there? Yeah. yeah. So, how many of you saw this movie, The Life of Pi? Oh, good. Wonderful. Well, I will just uh, bring back the memory of um, Pi's story because it illustrates what I'm uh, dealing with. Uh, it tells of the relationship between a boy and a tiger in a lifeboat. The, mo the movie is a beautiful example of reparative memory. Pai was a 15-year-old boy from India where his family owned a zoo full of wild animals. The family decided to migrate to Canada and they brought along some zoo animals in the ship. During the trip, the ship was hit, hit by a heavy storm and sank. Somehow, Pine managed to climb into a lifeboat. Uh, well, Pine managed to climb into a lifeboat where the other shipwrecked were. A badly hurt sailor, <laughs> a mean cook, who carried a knife, and Pai's mother. That was the true story. As time went by, horrible things happened in the boat. Violence increases, and as violence was happening there, a mysterious tiger shows in the boat. It just appears gradually. Instead of people, then the second story begins to develop between, in front of our eyes. Instead of people, what we see in the boat is a hurt zebra that gets killed by the hyena and an orangutan who ends up fighting and ends up by being killed by the hyena too. It is implied that Pai or the tiger got finally rid of the sailor or the hyena. Only Pai and the tiger remained and shared many adventures, leading to an attachment between them. 227 days passed before the boat reached a beach on the Mexican coast. As Pai is rescued, this tiger just disappears through the bushes, didn't look back, never to return. An attachment had been built between Pai and his tiger. Then the movie brings us to the final scenes when Pai is telling the story to a reporter who uh, seeked him to write the story. We find this Man, Pai, married with two kids, and he's telling his story to the reporter, very calm, at ease. And when the reporter uh, hears that story, he realizes that um, the zebra was the sailor. The monkey was Pai's mother. Both were killed by the hyena, who was the cook, and the tiger was Pai himself. And we see that Pai looks at this reporter, nods calmly, smiles, and says, which story do you prefer? <laughs> and the reporter thoughtfully says, the one with the tiger. Okay, what we see here, this fantastic story shows how our memory can accept new information, make powerful associations, and create a new set of memories that will constitute a parallel narrative. Okay, the, the <clears throat> depending on the intensity and the repetition of this new narrative, the body-mind system may take this parallel narrative as the truth. Actually, it's not take, it's choose. We find that we have two, we find out in our minds that we have a choice of two paths, and usually we choose the best one. 
The real facts are not erased at all, but the new narrative prevails in the theater of the mind. Helen Resnick wrote an excellent article years ago about false memories recovered in therapy. Uh, a feeling in search of a memory of 1995 in the Bioenergetics Journal. It is a wonderful paper to teach about sexual abuse. Helen describes how a woman recovered in therapy a memory of herself when she was 13, in which she believed that her father had abused her. Later in court, this claim was proved false, but it caused much suffering to that family. But it's also an illustration of how a second story may become the truth for the person who is convinced about it and who creates a livid uh, image of a second story. Well, grounded on the research about false memories, we may believe in the possibility of consciously applying techniques to promote reparative memories. It is not a magical trick. The same brain's ability and plasticity used to create and believe in false memories may create new healing reparative memories that can arise either spontaneously or be stimulated or even suggested in the therapy setting, which of course is a, a setting where there is support, trust, safety. We are challenged to explore this wonderful healing tool our brains developed for the good or for the worse. Um, Peter Levine, in his book, Memory and Trauma, has a chapter called Memory, Gift, and Curse. It's a very good book. It's uh, more recent, 2015. It's good to read it and uh, learn about memory the way he explains it. And then we have Homa Yunshari from California who wrote those two articles in the 2017 and 18, speaking of his own experience with new healing reconsolidated memories. But he was um, describing how he dealt with his own developmental trauma, which is different from a traumatic event I'm talking about here. I want to share an understanding that came from my own experience recovering from an assault and robbery I went through in my house four and a half years ago, and a healing hallucination that came to my mind's eyes as a second story. And it felt like watching a very real silent movie to find this second story. It was the middle of a summer vacation at 1.30 p.m. I was sitting at the dining room table reading calmly a newspaper, like I'm reading here, when suddenly three men materialized in front of me. They had broken into the house and they had pistols. I was immediately held and had the gun put to my head and threats like it cost me nothing to kill you right now and so on and so on. Well. In those situations, time seems to pass in slow motion. But the only thing I could think for myself was how to be safe by being, giving up any idea of reaction. So I froze into submission. However, luckily, my husband was upstairs. He had heard when they broke to the gate. He had locked himself, and he began to phone the police. So after 10 or 15 minutes that they went around the house with me, gun on my head, uh, they wanted to go up and uh, find out who, who else might be in the house. So we came to his door, the door was locked, and they began to kick the door, but they could hear through the door that my husband was there screaming on the telephone, send the police here, we're being assaulted, so on and so on. Of course, he was screaming very loud <laughs> through the door. So the, they heard it and realized, well, the alarm has been set. No way. Um, <clears throat> there is nothing else to do here. And also another lucky 
event that we have a security car service in the neighborhood. And at that moment, the neighbor had called the security car and it parked in front of my house. <laughs> so the, the other part of the group who was outside probably told them on the phone that security car is here, you better get out of there soon before the police arrives. So they turned and immediately those three men were running out of the house. And <clears throat> I can hear the noise of those three men running down. There is a ramp, not stairs. And they were running down. Um, like a stampede. <laughs> the whole thing took about 20 minutes as the cameras registered it. Of course, after that, I was looking for help and found it in a colleague who was an expert in emotional freedom technique, <laughs> EFT. It is that technique that deals with tappings like that, you know, in different parts of the body, and uh, you, you were directed to say several phrases very rapidly, so it creates a kind of confusion in your brain, and of course, that accesses the implicit memory. At the end of about 20 minutes of that session, uh, I had a clear hallucination that came before my eyes. It was like a short but very spontaneous and funny video. You'll see that. As the three men were running out of the house, I saw myself with the broomstick in my hands, and I was just calmly sweeping them out like that. I felt no anger, no high excitement there on the video. Just doing that simple, natural, sweeping them out of the house. As I became aware that this hallucination was coming to me, I immediately realized, aha, uh -huh, that's what really needs to happen in this situation. So I took it for myself. <laughs> OK, that dissociated image, I, I associated with it. And it was very funny, really. And this is the memory that persisted and the, the one with the broom. Every time I recall the story, it's crazy. Um, as Guy was speaking, uh, I, I associate that with the function of representation that our brain is capable of. The dissociation here serves to witness the scene as part of the theater of the mind, keeping a safe distance to avoid the body feelings of utter helplessness, panic, and, sp and pain. Sometimes a new image may spontaneously, and now I'm speaking about the clinic. Sometimes a new image may spontaneously arise, or even new imagery may be created in hypnotic trance state. And what we learn in um, timeline therapy, maintaining a safe distance and a safe dissociation. Uh, it's not a, a dissociation that comes from schizoid dissociation. It's a conscious dissociation, OK? Just building the story and staying away from it. The self-healing image my brain offered me produced instant relief. The image may be a tiger, like Pi created his tiger, or a simple broomstick. The new story is healing, and that's what matters. When I remember the facts, this is the version I recall. And why to bring this story here? To illustrate two points. One. When dealing with traumatic event first, we need to deactivate the dorsal vagus activity, possibly using conscious dissociation and a body-mind top-down technique directed to the narrative part of the brain involving hippocampus activity, like I had done in hypnosis with my therapist and the EFT sessions. After that, it will be easier and effective to discharge through neurogenic tremors, the restraint energy that has been mobilized during the event. I had tried neurogenic tremors right after the event, but the excitement increased and became intolerable, as I mentioned before. The second point is to facilitate or promote new reparative memories when a traumatic events uh, have been somehow worked through. 
I'm, speaking of deve I'm not speaking of developmental trauma. For that, please look up Shari's articles. Once the excessive emotional charge has been neutralized, the, past, the hippocampus job is to help to re-encode the old memory as past, as a past event that is modified by the new healing memory. However, in the clinic, if a new reparative memory does not arise spontaneously, uh, it's not a case of imposing a new happy ending. But after working through fear, anger, and pain, maybe we can carefully suggest how could this event have ended more satisfactorily for you and somehow help the client to build the second story. The client may create a new situation where he's not a victim in which he can restore his role as active agent. This is what the broomstick gave back to me. Uh, he can move from hypo to hyper-stimulated state into an active, regulated state. Summarizing, we looked at this process of memory re-encoding from the points of view of top-down interventions to diffuse an alertness state. Then recall, reconstruct, reconsolidate reparative memories and codify them as past event. Aiming those memories will be represented as past from now on, instead of returning as flashbacks. And discharge of excess energy through the neurogenic tremors. As in the movie The Life of Pi, in the middle of helplessness, a reparative memory may bring back faith and hope to build a new future. Finally, my intention was to share with you this real experience in which a combination of top-down resources with the bottom-up bioenergetic practices helped to regulate the body's life force to heal and to reconnect to love for oneself and for others. Thank you. Thank you, Odila, for the wonderful speech. And now I will ask for the second panelist. And she is a psychologist, psychotherapist, IIBA international trainer, and IIBA faculty member since 2006. She is the director of SIAB. Italian Society of Bioenergetic Analysis, past president of SIP, Italian Society of Psychotherapy. She is FIAP delegate for the European Association of Psychotherapy, former and senior trainer also in the person-centered approach. She worked with Carl Rogers, with groups in Italy, Ireland, and Hungary. She has published in Italian and international magazines, and she's author of several scientific articles. She's involved with training and supervision since over 20 years. With you, Patricia Moselli. Ok. Anche l'altro, ok. Buongiorno. Uh, avrei preferito parlare in italiano. I would prefer to speak in Italian because my, it's my own language. I feel a little bit more secure. But I will try to do my best. So be patient with my English because it's a kind of Napolitan English or Italian English. We will see. <laughs> But uh, I want to go back to um, Guy's presentation because I think it was beautiful 
It was very inspiring for us as a Banerjee uh, community. So I will start with that. Uh, because I was inspired by the hymn when Music. So I think that is our big bang in some sense because everything started for us from here. And uh, as uh, when I was uh, listening, well, because he uh, gave it to us uh, his speech in Italian, and that was very inspiring for me. I was at the same time I was reading uh, Moran books because we were invited him in uh, our conference in Italy. And so this was a very strange case of synchronicity because this man is very old, but is very inspiring. And also he told me that he's been inspired by the thought of the Marine since many, many years. So I think we have also to take the challenge of Maureen that is a, the author of the essay of complexity because I think we have to think in a global way as a energetic therapist, and especially in what Marin called the planetary humanism. So we must consider globality as Guy has shown us, because globality is a kind of challenge to complexity. So uh, we have to be open also, I think, to new knowledge, that is the big challenge that we have now as a bioenergetic therapist. And I think Guy gives us a very beautiful way how to put complexity together, how to put scientific thought with a very emotional and sensational when they use the sound, for example. So I think we really have to train us as a bioenergetic therapist to think and not to have them to stay link to a very simple way to understand bioenergetics. Also, like uh, George Darwin at the Memorial Lowen remind us to not to see just a simple the theory that will go and try to control the old reality, but be open to a new kind of, of see the complexity of the human being. And uh, we don't have to think that we can control the reality, especially nowadays that are very complicated. Psychopathologic change, everything changed, so we have to be flexible and to have a thought that able us to dialogue with the reality and to negotiate with the reality in a sense. But also we have to dispel some illusion that First of all, we cannot think that complexity means to elimination of simplicity, because sometimes we will have to be very simple and basic, also rooted in our way of thinking. Because reality is contain also duplicity, and so as a human being is complex because containing duplicity, a humanity is not just animality, we know, 
but there is no anim uh, humanity with that animality. We know very well that, so we have to go back to our roots. And in this, uh, the same way as Guy has uh, reminded us, we are in a very complex way to see the world. And so this ordinary organization coexists as well as animality and nature. And that is our, the vision that we can have about man's condition. And no, we know that man is like both biophysical, but also psychological, <laughs> social, cultural one. And those three dimensions, they have to always be a dialoguing to each other. Uh, Lowen has reminded us that we were born by cosmo, nature, life. And because of our culture and, mi and mind, in a sense, we became strange to the, this universe. So, Again, complexity help us to make this conjunction. And so we have, we have to ask ourselves, for example, if you, we think uh, a little bit more in a complex way, not in a simple way, and the big question are how to make the old coexist with the new. And the old are the basic theory would also reflect in the evolution of bioenergetics, for example. But also we know that knowledge, uh, according to Maureen, is divided in blocks. And that is very interesting because it's like also sometimes our body is divided in blocks. One, on one side we have emotion and the other side we have our rationality, our thinking. And so again the challenge is, for example, in the theory of energetic, how to put those way integrating. I think Guy has uh, given to us a very beautiful example how we can integrate this kind of knowledge and not to have a separating our humanistic thought that means emotion to a scientific thought. But so the uh, question, uh, sorry, but uh, I think something is going, uh, okay, sorry. The question for us as a energetic therapist is a problem that we have in Italy, for example, because uh, uh, is how we can recognize our humanistic roots that put love as an important, as a many other approach, of humanistic approach, like, like Rogers did, Yalom and other, that puts love as an important agent of cure. But at the same time, we have to be open and work and negotiate in that with the scientific approach that make us to be heard by the, by the scientific community. I wrote, so if you don't understand my English, it would be easy to see that. But I think, for example, in Italy, uh, because otherwise we can be confused with many new ages, diffuses and confuses. That's the risk, I think, about energetic, Or to be confused with many new ages approach where unfortunately in Italy also Wikipedia put us. And we have that strange situation in Italy. We are recognized by the university. We can give training for the, for the university. Uh, minister of the university has allowed us to give training in psychotherapy. We are recognized, I mean, uh, we are as a CIAB in many important uh, mainstream approach, but the social, reality put us in uh, that sense of uh, alternative medicine, something that bioenergetic is not. And since we are an alternative medicine, we have to, be, to have this disclaimer. So that's why I, we are thinking and we are always careful, at least in Italy, but I think we have to be careful globally, not to be confused because we have so much richness as Guy and the other presenter, Vita yesterday, show us that we cannot be confused in something that is very simple 
and new age. That is something that we are not, because we are people that are much more dedicated to our, and also the beautiful thoughts. Ah, sorry. I want to show you how I explain sometimes Banergetics when I'm invited in a, a presentation with the other Banergetics, not just Banergetics, but many mainstream approach. So I use video that then you turn to our relationship with the Department of Research with the University of Rome uh, give me, uh, allowed me to use it because I use those videos from the infant research approach to show the rules of the implicit memory and to, for to see how those implicit memory can be embodied. That works usually very well because after this video, people understand why pleasure and pain are in are embodied in our, uh, uh, in our soul, spirit, and body. So those are two videos, one on pain. And you see this is the press mother, and see how she treats the child. She doesn't have any contact. And look how she used the body with no augment with the child. Also, the tone of voice is not a tune, as Give was explaining. <coughs> I see the pain in the child. <laughs> see, that can be very, very fast for the people to understand what we mean by something that is implicit memory embodied in the body, because come directly to the body of people who watch it. Now, so... Fra un po' esci! Fra un po' esci! Si? Aiuto! Aiuto! Lasciami capire! Lasciami capire! Oh! See? But we know that uh, from Baby Lackman that those are fundamental uh, memory that we stay for all our life. But as Reich stated, relation and also Lowen, uh, but uh, he started with that uh, idea that uh, relationship characterized by love can build in the child baby the sensation of pleasure. Otherwise, he cannot have it. So he learned very early when the mother is attuned to, uh, to him. But also relationship, unfortunately, that are destructive, sadistic, or neglected, they can just create in the child body negativity. And they can, so it's like in the life, he cannot know in pleasure but just maybe relief or gratification. So 
we have to be very, uh, it's very important, this statement. Because we know very well that pain is inscribed in, um, in our muscular structure on a molecular level. And also it's very important because epigenetic has uh, shown now, explained now, our inflammation and contraction, because uh, inflammation comes by contraction, basically. And that can affect really serious our health in sense of cancer and all that. And inflammation is the basic things that really is difficult for us. And so we know also that implicit memory are inscribed in our body and they're increasing in our life energy. So we don't have to remember that because it's our basic. That's I say that we have to combine both. And also we know as a, a bioenergetic therapist that we have no uh, doubt about that psychotherapy cannot get, go deep without an energetic and dynamic model. Because without a deeper primary process, I think that psychotherapy is restricted. I really believe that, so we don't have to lose this faith, I think, as a bioenergetic therapist to compensation, adaptation, cognitive understanding of a compromise, compromise or a clutter acceptance. And you know, that will define us from different other body approach to trauma that nowadays are so in auge. So the big question is how we can restore the life force in the to the reality, how we can immobilize still stagnant contracted energy, I still that, how to restore pulsation in the body, how to work with the energy concretely in a therapeutic field. I think those are very basic questions that are still simple but very deep and we still have to do, to see in this way. But, uh, sorry. But so, if you that we assume that the negativity stay in our bones, in our implicit memory, it's again a case where I think the old come back to the new. Because since the beginning, we are being expert, not also <laughs> all the Banerjee community, in dealing with negativity and resistance. So, so we don't have to be afraid of that because we are really expert much more than other people are. And so we have to see that dance between new and old, what is our ground in the, the what are the new idea because we don't have to um, refuse our strength. And um, in that sense, I think that uh, uh, Guy already answered to, in a beautiful way to all this question, because I think he put together, and when he said that the, the other people are envious in the way that we know, I think he did a big statement in this community. I really thank him for to do that. And also, I think that he answered in a very concrete, oh, sorry, in a very concrete way to all those answers, but since I have a, since I was in Whistler, so I grow in a little bit in the Banergetic community, international community. I have also, I want to mention in this uh, plenary session, my uh, respect and love for Ben Shapiro because I think uh, he's one of the most creative uh, thinking in Banergetics. <laughs> Me and Ben, we have a long relationship. He was my first supervisor in Whistler. When I came, I was completely terrified and jumped on me and said, oh, you are too. But in, during the year, we have a very deep, a complex, uh, sometimes we fight, but I love him and I have a lot of respect for his creativity. So I think, uh, and uh, I will t once Ben told me, you will manicure my theory. And so I think, okay, I'll try to do. Because whichever I put, I bring this uh, theory 
in um, a conference that, would, that was about the use of humor in psychotherapy. And I think he's a master about using the humor also in psychotherapy. And also, is uh, when he's starting with the exploration of devil and negativity, and, and then Ben developed his own theory about subset. That, in a sense, if you, we think, if we look about, that can be align us with the modern way, a concept that now is very updated in psychotherapy. Everybody's talking about subself. And that's also put us able, hysteria about subself, about, uh, make us able to dialogue with many trauma therapy, like Ogden, especially the Fisher and the subsets that is dissociating itself. And as I said, there is also a master using the humor in psychotherapy. I want to quote him. Sub-self are an island of shock, fear, pain, anger, formed in the childhood. They protect us from being threatened again, and they have a lot of energy. So that is the core. And that's the way that it also, in a sense, uh, is different from other approach that working with the dissociating uh, differentiated uh, subself because each subsets have the, his own body a psychological characteristic for Ben and they can be expressed that in a energetic way. That means that is a master how to charge and contain the energy. That means how to build in the body the possibility to have a greater energy and so to be more aligned to the life force. So I think that is really important. But we have also to remember, and so again the complexity, that like Guy use a very fascinating metaphor that from the fair point, I a little bit prefer again to use the metaphor between culture to nature because I'm a little bit uh, grounded in the old VAC, but it's not important because it's this way that we have to go from one side to the, to the other side. If we can go from the culture to our nature that is self-regulated. So it's very important. And it's very important because I think to see this uh, way the therapist can help the clients to see his fear of emotion, the fear of instinct, and especially he built, that is a big energetic movement, I think, the trust to remain, to have an identity. Because if you, we have a body, we have also an identity in reality. So that is very, very important. But sometimes, in the new nowadays, I think we have to face the fact that uh, sometimes our clients have lost the ability to deal with reality. So I like, I think it's interesting also to see the metaphor of the therapist. Who is the therapist? The therapist is the, the uh, helper of the warrior on the chariot is the one that gives him the arms to go and to do the battle in life. And so it's not him that does something for the patient, that is my general roots, but it's the client that do the work for himself. I think that is very important also. So we can see psychotherapy also as an epic travel. We can look, because sometimes, especially um, social media, they try in this narcissistic world, they try to avoid the conflict. Everything has to be very nice, simple. We want to be nice to each other. And, and that's, uh, in a sense, that is also a complexity that we have to look. It seems like the people try to escape from the tragedy of life. But unfortunately, life is also tragic, pain, and other things. So I think we can see also the therapy uh, like an 
and uh, the client, like an epic hero, that goes through the tragedy of his life. I think that is very important, because otherwise, if he is escaping from tragedy, as Reich was stated, he will find a yes, yes release, but also dissociation. So we have to be very clear about to also to make our client to confront of what is difficult in life. And so that the hold comebacks also, and is a reflection about an healthy aggressivity. And so everything, everybody would like to have that hat when we were child, and to combat the angels in our childhood. But I think it's very important, because if you go to the Latin word, aggredior, means that there is a lot of energy in that, and we don't have to lose that sense. Is important, but so we don't have to also to be afraid of people that have that in their genus. They're like, a <laughs> because that came from my family. I'm very grateful to my family because we fight and then we love. We, it's Napolitan, so we scream and then we make love. We, we fight and then we make joke. And that is a part of life and goes into my it's my way to understand love. Also, when I get angry also with the community of energetics, for me, means that I love them. <laughs> Otherwise, I will be distracted. I, don't, I will not care about it. That goes to my idea. So it's also an occasion to show a little bit of me on that. Because... Uh, I really think the only just where we are grounded in our emotion, both positive and negative one, we can truly meet our force. Our life force is there. When we deny our difficult feeling, we cut our vitality, in a sense. So I think, the, of course, also we, as a therapy, were to be able to be grounded in our feeling, and, uh, and not to be, try to be mythical, because we are human beings, and so we have to be rooted in what we like and we dislike about our feeling. And so uh, then I think it's three important challenge that the Marine put to the attention of educator. And since we are international trainer, but also therapists, we have to take this challenge, I think, because I think they are very important. One is the cultural change that put us the question, how we make, because we have the scientific culture, and they're very important to integrate that with the, our humanistic emotional roots. But I think that has to be maintained with an ethical point of view and what I show, what I do in my society, I have much trust with my younger colleagues because I think they have a great ability to be passionate in their research. So I think as the trainers, we should really support that movement of younger people that are also passionate about neuroscience research and everything because I think it's fundamental. A sociological challenge that uh, the emotion, emotion is a, a, a scientific has to be in a constant dialectic, but we know very well that we, con we cannot go in a patient world. Just as Bob Lewis was reminded of us yesterday, with the neuroscience, we need ourselves, we need our emotion to go into to the world of our patients. So we never have to, re, uh, to neglect that. And third one, the civil challenge. Because in this difficult time, the therapist cannot be seen just in a small contest, but we have to think in a broader contest. We have, to, we have many problems and that they are not just regarding our private practice. They do with the, uh, they are characterized with problems that are characterized by democracy deficit, 
for example, integration, immigration, common gun, uh, good, sorry, environment, uh, working with patients that have not enough money to take care of uh, their mental health. So we have, I think many people in Brazil, in Italy, in other countries do that. And I think we have to be even more and more open to do that, working with immigration, with, uh, working with people that have worked with immigration, with minority and all that. So we have developed many other ways to do that. But also, to go back, we have to remember that basically what we do now in Banergetics is going slowly, building trust and connection, transmitting empathic resonance, helping the client to find their own locus of control in the body, Work, it's important they work on deep shame, and they're self-hated, but also we have to deal with the client feel of anger and rage emerging from the past. I think that's combined my vision of what is the old and new in Banergetics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for your speech. Oh. Um, uh, now I will invite our third panelist that I recently knew her life force and who was with Bob Lewis yesterday knows what I am talking. Yeah, he, and she is a master guide and counselor director of training from NZSBA and has a private practice in Wellington, New Zealand. She has provided input at IIBA conferences on trauma and relational trauma. And, in, and she is interested in how neuroscience underpins early development, emotion, affect, regulation, and the power of the heart. With you, Pai Bowden. In this keynote, Guy has called upon us to leave our hearts, minds, and eyes wide open while we think about what is bioenergetics, not only through the lens of the whole world, but also of the universe beyond, and not only through the vast spaces amongst and beyond the stars, but also down into the heart of nature, and its invisible particles of matter. Oh, and everything in between. Guy also reminds us as bioenergetic therapists to remember and deeply recognize all this because it is engraved in us, in our physical chemical properties, our vital pulsations, and our corporal, corporal rhythms. In other words, we humans are all this. And furthermore, he points out that bioenergetics took on the shape it did because Reich and later Lowen relentlessly traced this profound force that bound us all together. They called it bioenergy energy of the universe converted into biological energy, and it became the home of bioenergetics, bioenergetic analysis. 
While Guy has point, seemed to point our way to everything, as we've seen, there is much more in the pages of his keynote. For instance, he seems to have produced an updated version of the fundamental bioenergetic concepts, basing them on the radical principles of the, of the life force itself. Guy's keynote also has the feeling of including us all. Since it seemed homed by his years and years on the road, and by the multitude of countries, societies, cultures, and races that he has immersed himself in and seen so deeply. And so for me, his presentation today feels a little bit like a Christmas stocking filled with many gifts. Learning from his travels in lands near and far away that we can read again and again to renew our inspiration in bioenergetics. For the, I'm leaving out the next paragraph for those translating. And so this morning, Guy has opened up us up to everything. So where do you go? I have chosen to focus very narrowly in on the topic of love and the regulation of the life force. And I'm going to share some thoughts about two-person regulation and the role of love in this critical life endeavor. Now, yesterday, we had some powerful input from Dacia describing what is desperately needed for families and communities to thrive and how often these days this is not available. There was the implication that love was involved or not involved but it was pretty much invisible and never center stage. This paper starts with love and seeks to ascertain its influence, its properties, and the power that creates and drives it. And there isn't anywhere better to look at these questions than where the newborn meets its mother. Now, as we know from the writings of Stephen Porges and Alan Shaw, this tiny newcomer is in dire need of a regulating other and simply would not survive without it at all. So we might assume that evolution would have produced something pretty powerful to keep that baby alive. And we look at the pathway from the beginning of pregnancy to its birth, the baby's mother has been strongly invited out of her head and into her body through the experiences of pregnancy, morning sickness, and the birthing process. And then there are the hormonal tides awaiting her once the baby is born. All of this, we might imagine, is a valiant attempt by nature to provide the most reliable life force regulation possible. Of course, it does not work out like this for all babies, but if the mother can respond to the power of her uh, own hormones, then she will love that baby because that is what those hormones are for. And in turn, it means she is likely to care for it through both good and bad times. Other mothers, however, may not get access to this ability and may not love their baby. As we know, they may resent or even hate it. Again, we know from Alan Shaw's work, there's likely to be a considerable difference in the life force regulation of those two hypothetical babies. And it is likely that at least some of this difference is about the mother's ability to love. So what is the role of love in regulation? In Damasio's book, Self Comes to Mind, he clearly states that powerful positive feelings such as love are simply byproducts of a well-regulated body. In fact, the experience of pleasurable feelings is a sign that one's bodily systems are all functioning 
and in the most favourable setting of their narrow homeostatic range. And for, furthermore, when this happens, these systems are also in a state of coherency with each other. Damasio notes that the effect of all of this produces a sense of fluidity and ease in the body. The reverse is also true. Homostatically dangerous ranges express themselves as not so pleasant or even painful feelings. So the mothers who have been able to come through the birth process with the effect of serotonin and oxytocin in place are not only likely to love the baby, their love will ensure that her own body is being positively regulated. And this will give the mother a greater ability to respond calmly and empathetically when the baby is distressed. She can hold that baby's breaking heart close to her own steady heartbeat. Or she can walk the baby, or she can do what is ever going to calm its painful state, painful state. But this is not all Damasio has to say. He calls the, calls the babyest earliest feelings primordial feelings and describes them as wordless, unadorned, and connected to nothing but sheer existence. These feelings arise in the periaqueductal gray, which I'll call a PAG from now on, and are simply the result of a baby's response to the particular environment in which it has been born. More importantly, Damasio tells us, these very early feeling states become embedded into the homeostatic process itself. This happens because the PAG is a one of three upper brainstem nuclei that are tightly bound together in a thousandth of a second feedback loop with the body. And their combined role is to maintain life. The presence of the PAG's feeling experience within this fundamental life regulation loop means that while patterns of homeostatic regulation in the physical body are being set early on in life, so too is the patterning of these, of these early emotional states. In fact, Damasio goes on to say that these early states become a deep root which cannot be alienated, and that they become indispensable components of the self. So we see from this that the emotional compo component of early life regulation is likely to have a disproportionate, power, a disproportionate power over how this baby is going to feel. The net effect of all of this, as we learned yesterday, is that loved babies' bodies are likely to be increasingly regulated by the social engagement, the ventral vagal system, setting of the mother's autonomic nervous system, while the lives of resented or hate, hated babies will be more likely dysregulated by the mother's dorsal vagal system. And that this has a devastating and lasting effect on self-regulation. So we see again that the profound differences in those two hypothetical babies' lives right from the start may well continue unfolding through their lifespans. And this would suggest that the presence of love in that baby's life is likely to make a considerable impact on the baby's life ahead of them. Now I'd like to return briefly to Guy's keynote and his description of love as a state of being that dwells deeply within us. He also notes it is handed on to us through the process of attachment by our biological mother. And now 
this seems most certainly to be just the case. The question now, as we go deeper into the qualities of love, becomes, how does the fluid, easy state of the body that underpins this love come about? We know that the autonomic nervous system is the deepest layer in this process, but how might the state get organized in the body proper? And it seems that Lowen, in his preface to Love, Sex and the Heart, was wondering the same thing when he said, if the heart is involved in every experience of love, as it seems to be, then we must assume that such expressions as a heart filled with love also describe a physical phenomenon. And then he adds, although hearts do not fall to pieces when love is rejected or a loved one is lost, clearly something breaks in this situation. So now we have one answer. Damasio tells us that the heart doesn't break when we feel heartbroken, but that heartbreak is a, system, a symptom of a heart, mind, and body that are all in a homeostatically strained state. This creates deregulation, he says, and plunges us into one of those not so pleasant or even painful feelings. Yes, indeed. The second question is, how is it that these total body events come so miraculously together? Now, McCready and his colleagues at the Heart, Heart Maths Institute have come up with some relatively thinking about this in their article, The Coherent Heart, 2006. This paper describes their first 10 years of research and how they were mindful of Damasio's position that negative and positive emotional feelings are created by negative and positive body states. In a recent review of their early work, McCready described how the focus of their research had only become the heart because they found that particular organ was the most sensitive measure of emotional change. Having established this, however, they went on to ask themselves, as Lowen had, why do people experience the feeling or sensation of love, as well as heartache, in the physical area of the heart? To find answers to this more fundamental question, McCready and colleagues described how they carried out detailed research focusing on such me measurements as the EEG, the brain waves, skin conductance, heart rate, blood pressure, and hormone levels. As a result of their focus on the heart, they found it was not the heart rate or even heart rate variability that was the most significant aspect of the heart's involvement in emotion. It was as rhythmical patterns of beating. As well, they came to see that the communication with and among the body systems occurred, quite possibly, because of the generation and transmission of these heartbeat rhythms by the heart. They believed that this means, this means of transmitting signals was only just one of four ways in which information from the heart was passed on throughout the body and the brain. The other means were neurological, hormonal, and electromagnetic. From these experiments, they proposed that the heart was in fact generating system-wide signaling, and that this, was produ and that this produced a global level of organization that bound and synchronized the body as a whole. This seemed to them a good fit with Damasio's conviction that it was the coherence level of body and brain functioning that determined whether pleasurable or painful feelings would be experienced. 
And now it seems that the heart might just stand at the center of all this. Now, whatever your view of the work carried out by Heart Mass Institute and the way they have progressed this information, I have to say their portrayal of the heart as conductor of the orchestra makes sense to me in understanding the constant ebb and flow of varying, ever varying emotional states. And by now, it seems to me unsurprising that the presence of love in a baby's life not only profoundly affects the course of its life, but it is surely one of the most powerful life force regula regulatory devices known to mankind. I'd now like to add a small unplanned story that invited itself to end this paper. My mother really wanted a fourth baby. My father was finishing his doctorate, and this baby was to be hers, as he didn't want another child. They each wanted a different name for this baby, but couldn't agree on which would be the main one. So that baby never really got a name, and is still known by the nickname which happened to turn up around that time. But now, after many, many years of deep bioenergetic work, I have experienced and recognized a number of memory feeling states that can only pertain to that baby. In each, there is the absolute, absolute absence of words the utter helplessness of being a bundle that could be handed around at will, and the simplicity of beingness, and somehow a knowing. When this baby first arrived in the world, she seemed just to know that, well, she knew this mother very well already. She had been bathed in her love all the time she'd been growing in the womb. This baby also, also seemed to know that she herself was love. This deriving from the comfort of the loving maternal body. Now my mother told me many years later that when she first saw me, there was something about me and it seemed to be I was saying, here am I, this is me. One day recently, when I was involved in a group session, lying down and listening to some exquisite music, I realized that I'd have to tune out because something very deep was stirring. Later, I was thankfully able to replay the same music and dropped again into the same place. This time, I was the tiny baby with that mother and I was bathed in the bliss and glory of a universe where humanity and spirit were one. This state was so clear to me that I surprised myself by suddenly speaking out loud in wonder. She was the love of my life. And in that instance, recognized all the terrible failures of connection that I had experienced throughout much of it. When I tried to put the blissful part of, experience, of this experience into words later that day, the only thing that described the experience of being that baby was that I was simply a shining star of energy that was composed of my own and my mother's love and that went out beyond us both into the universe. I was blissfully unaware at that time, however, that there was another who would soon obliterate all this. And now in present time, 
as I at last have finished struggling with myself to complete this paper. I realize that the life and death struggle between my parents for the heart and soul of that baby has been playing out as I've tried to write a piece about regulation. One moment I have felt high on the crest of a wave and the next I was plunging into the depths of hopelessness. But now I am inspired by Guy's statement that the, that the connection with the mother consists of stardust converted into atoms, cells, hearts, womb, brain, implicit memory, and arms outstretched to another. I'm deciding that it's time to walk away from under some existential sword that has always been threatening to fall down on me if I had too much of anything. As from now, I would hope to live more permanently, more radiantly in that powerful life force of love that I had experienced so briefly right at the beginning of my life. Thank you. Uh, first question to Guy. How can we develop an interaction between neuroscience and bioenergetic clinics without losing our identity? <laughs> the other is all... Two minutes. Two minutes. Just a minute, come. Ah, the, 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 the microphone. Uh, really, uh, it's difficult to answer to such a complex question. Probably uh, our roots in bioenergetic analysis is the body, but more specifically, uh, the affective emotional uh, level. Uh, I guess we are trying in bioenergetic analysis to bring together our mammalian roots and our specific uh, existence as human beings. That means the capacity to think, to imagine, to symbolize, to create arts and cultures, so when you ask how to, how to investigate about that, would it be hard? We have yet some important investigations. They are not specifically in bioenergetic analysis, but they are in some levels we are uh, working in, in the in the emotional level, in the deep, inside more, in, in, the, in the nervous level, in the autonomic system, nervous system level with Porges, with Siegel, with Amasio, and so on. I think we would have today to take time together, or some of us, to take that time to take the these results of investigation to put it together uh, and to say, well, how we work in bioenergetic analysis has been uh, argumented with that, 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 and that research. And maybe we can, from that, discover what we would need specifically us as bioenergetic analysis to expand, you know. But uh, first, 
I think that we have to put together many things that have been yet demonstrated, and from that to organize a perspective, a very bioenergetic investigation perspective. Okay. Okay. So the second question is from is for Ojila. Um, Ojila is the EFT EFT effective with any trauma that is not related to a specific event, like preverbal trauma. I can't say that about EFT exactly because I'm not a professional of EFT. I received this session from a friend. I'm not trained. What I use uh, is hypnosis and timeline therapy. And my message here was about um, working from this part of the brain that is accessible to uh, other information, other inputs. And then this new input can connect and associate with input that comes from the trauma experience. Now, about preverbal, preverbal um, developmental trauma, um, I think it hap what happens is a lot of, uh, the result is a lot of, um, low self-esteem and that's where we can um, work in different ways the yeah self-esteem must be built in different ways I believe you could remove the shock experience like a difficult childbirth where there was almost the baby was almost dead this kind of experience could be removed. But relational, I think you have really to work through in the, in the therapist relationship. Okay. So, now for Patricia. Um, could you mind explaining about humanity and animality, how we can integrate the, the, this part of these parts in an ecological human way inside the therapeutic process? I think uh, this going back to the fact that the point that uh, we had to work also uh, we don't have to lose our root about working with the negativity, aggressivity, but we can do that in a very, we can do that just in a very safe environment. Because if you, we have, vicino così? Allora, because uh, just if the relationship with the analyst, with the therapist is strong, the person can go deep into the more uh, spontaneous anim animal side. But otherwise, it's just a rage that they will destroy everything. So we don't want that. Sometimes we overdo that in bioenergetics, like we re-traumatize people with aggressivity. But that was not just our expertise, because I think also for many years, analysts, we re-traumatize people with distance. They were going to anali analysis for to have contact and they receive distance. At the same time, people that were traumatized, for in, uh, they came to Bioenergetics and they were with that an environment of, of closeness, they were re-traumatizing again. But in a safe environment, I think we have to uh, to look about our animality because we know, just in an exercise class, when we do all, all the animal, then we feel more released. 
like we use the aggressivity, we play, and we do the cut, and then we feel like our heart is open. So it's for sure that going back to the animality will give us the, uh, the access, I think, to a vital force, but it has to be done in an environment that is very safe when we do with a deeper sense of instinct animality in a deeper way. For Pi, Pi, okay. What we can do as bioenergetic therapists and community to make this world better as low priced sessions <laughs> and classes may be not enough. Well, I think that somebody from South America should probably be uh, answering this, however, like that. From the perspective of where I was coming from this morning, uh, I believe that we need to be more, keep working at our embodiment, becoming more in our bodies because the energy goes out around. And if we work with our bodies, we can access, hopefully, the, the more loving and caring values that are so deeply needed outside in the world. And then there's, a, there's the... That goes out. I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure most people have realised um, with their clients uh, that family members come for help and friends come for help. Uh, so I'm going to just stay with the idea of quality, quality bioenergetics, with, with the idea that the powerful energy that we've released from our, released from our bodies will spread in a magical way. Electromagnetic, probably, but I'm not a scientist, so... I have a bad news because the time is running and we have to finish. 